I listened to last week's talk. I wasn't able to participate. And so I wanted to kind of comment briefly on that and talk about a couple of principles that I think are really important. Um, last week, is, as I listened to the different folks and as I went back and uh, thought about what Denver had taught, um, the kind of the takeaways for me were one, process matters. The process matters immensely. And um, as we go through different things in the movement, in preparing for a conference um, in the spring, that the conference is incredible. It's going to be terrific. I can tell that already. But the beauty of what we're doing is that we're meeting together. We're discussing together. We're working together. Our hearts are being knit together. And that really is what I believe God is trying to accomplish with us. He's trying to knit our hearts together because until we're of one heart, we can't really be of one mind. Um, and so I'm excited about that. I was just saying to Daryl and Shawnee right before this started, how hopeful I am. I am so filled with hope that we're going to pull this off, that Zion is going to be a reality, that we are going to have a temple. So as we look at the world around us and we look at the political situation, the COVID situation, whatever, we of all people on earth have reason to hope. And I'm very grateful for that. I, you know, I feel that every day. Um, the other thing, and I think it was, uh, is her name Lisa Bowler, Brian's wife? She said that she really believes in experiential learning, the idea of doing a Passover and having this experience together. And I really, as I've been considering this idea of a concerted effort, I thought, wow, what a great way for the Lord to teach us experientially, for us to have an experience together um, and an opportunity to learn together. And so those were some of the, the things that came from last week's meeting that kind of dovetail nicely into tonight's topic. And then the only other thing I want to mention before I put the PowerPoint on that Sandra and I put together a little while ago was um, the idea of prayer. As a fellowship, our little group here in Spanish Fork, we uh, were going through kind of a little course, a curriculum that we'd all agreed on where we were studying Denver's talks, the 10 talks that he gave going back to basics and saying, how would we teach this to a newcomer? Someone who maybe didn't have their um, feet in the LDS Mormon tradition. How would we introduce these topics? You know, maybe my kids who are teenagers didn't listen to any of the talks. I wasn't around when the 10 talks were given. I wasn't even in the movement then. So I went back and listened to them on CDs and then on the podcast and things like that. How would we present? So we've been studying those and exploring faith and repentance. And then a number of us on the same day, within 10 minutes of each other, all had this idea to explore the topic of prayer, to go back and study the topic of prayer. And we've had some really incredible experiences as a small group exploring prayer. We found tons in the scripture on prayer. Um, and prayer is a really efficacious way to knit hearts together. And I just want to read a couple of quotes, if I may. Um, and this comes from a, oh, a 16th century mystic. You guys may have heard about her, but she wrote a little book called, oh, uh, what did she call A Short Method of Prayer. And essentially, this is a woman in the 1600s, 1700s, who's talking about receiving the second comforter, having an experience with Christ. She wasn't a nun. She was considered a heretic, you know, thrown in jail for seven years because of what she taught. And some of the things that she teaches are just incredible about the prayer of the heart. But let me read this quote to you just one second. Nothing is easier than to have God and to live upon him. He is more truly in us than we are in ourselves. 
And this is the thing that I love that she says, he is more anxious to give himself to us than we are to possess him. All that we want is to know the way to seek him, which is so easy and so natural that breathing itself is not more so. And I think of that, I think, you know, Denver has said that the Lord wants to know us and that, you know, we just have to draw near to him. We just have to seek him. And so I think sometimes we complicate it. We're not as childlike as we need to be. Um, and I'm hoping that as we discuss tonight, that in our hearts, we can all have a prayer that we can be drawn out in prayer to the Lord as we're talking one with another about this idea of a concerted effort. Um, does anyone have any comments so far about what I've said about this idea of our hearts being knit together and the importance of the process? Uh, just real quick, Peter, someone did ask, uh, who was the author of that, or who were you talking about? The oh. Her name was Jean Guillon, and the book is called A Short Method of Prayer. It's available on Amazon for like six bucks, um, and she just talks about kind of different ways to pray. Her primary way that she discusses is this idea of using the scriptures. She doesn't use this term as a Urim and Thummim, where you take a section of scripture and just ponder it so that you get the essence of the Lord's character imbued in you as you're reading the scripture. So you're not reading for information or theology or rhetoric. You're reading to commune with God. And uh, that's really her method. But it's, you know, there's a truth in that, but... Yeah, it's a great, great book. If any of you are interested, I can send you a free PDF. So um, I'm going to share my screen with you now with a little PowerPoint, if that's okay. Um, if I can figure out how to do that. Is that up? Yes. Okay, great. And Sandra, you're welcome to chime in at any time. But uh, Sandra and I and a couple of others had kind of worked on this originally. In fact, Shawnee's parents had come to the very first meeting where we talked about the idea, McKay was there, of a concerted effort. That phrase, concerted effort, is used a couple of times, once in a talk by Joseph Smith and once in a talk by Denver. Um, and so I'm just going to go through these slides and um, I'll read them and maybe Sandra could read one or two of them, but uh, we'll kind of explain what our effort is and kind of what, uh, what we're gunning for um, as, a, as a body, as a group, and kind of how we think this would be of benefit to those who prayerfully feel like they want to participate. And maybe others are not interested in participating. This isn't their portion as far as building zion goes but uh, i'll go ahead and read this believers in several utah county fellowships have come together hoping to emulate the example of the scriptures project where individuals who were moved upon by the holy spirit gather together to accomplish a work um, um the work you know what we hope to do is have a united effort to carry out the instructions that are giving given for building a physical zine and so if you've been moved upon by the spirit of the lord in preparing for zine we'd love for you to join and participate so here are a couple of quotes from denver as to why we're doing this um, that were given in in various talks and so i'll go ahead and read those um there will be no deliverance by any government, church, or institution operated by men. The pitiful arm of man is nothing compared with the arm of God. The Lord is the creator of this world, and he gave dominion over his creation to Adam. Adam still presides, and the original order set up in the beginning will return before Christ comes to take back his creation. His kingdom is coming. Accomplishing what needs to be done before his return will make us subject to the divine king skills are needed learn useful things to help preserve order and comfort agriculture metallurgy medicine mechanics construction engineering hydraulics husbandry 
and every practical skill will benefit God's kingdom. So will literature, music, art, and humanities. Society needs to have a fire to cook and a fire in the hearts to make life whole. Learn all the useful knowledge the world can offer, and remember the, the knowledge of God is more valuable than it all. So as mentioned earlier, um, the Lord has taught the principle that never in your, nevertheless in your temporal things, you shall be equal in all things, and this not grudgingly. Otherwise, the abundance and the manifestations of the spirit will be withheld. So when we're preparing a place for gathering, there's certain things that are going to be required, a water supply, a wastewater system, roads, some form of energy, and a temple for meetings, instruction, and conferences. These are the necessary things to come first, and will make water commonly and equally available, hygiene commonly and equally available, movement through open roads and trails commonly and equally available, and access to heat and light commonly and equally available. He then continues, we take much of these for granted, but these things currently tie us to Babylon. There are great calamities soon to befall the world. God's people are to escape the tribulation which shall descend upon you, that you may stand independent above all other creatures beneath the celestial world by the work they shall accomplish beforehand. God will instruct, but he must do the work, but we must do the work. There will be many skills needed, blacksmiths, carpenters, farmers, ranchers, electricians, plumbers, roofers, and every practical skill will be needed. Many skills are lost to urban dwellers. We need to recover those lost skills. The route to equality is forged through united effort to accomplish the instructions we are given. Unity will lead to equality. So what do you guys think of that idea? Unity will lead to equality. Does anyone want to share their thoughts? I think this is Shawnee. I think that if we are living in a place where we are using our hands and we're having to work the land and build the homes and you know tend the animals and all that stuff, we we are going to be helping other people. You know, we can't all be blacksmiths, carpenters, farmers, ranchers, electricians, plumbers, roofers, and other things. And so it's it's going to, I think it makes us in a sense equal because it doesn't matter if I'm tending the animals or somebody else is, they all need to be tended and fed and, you know, taken care of. And so we all need to be willing and hopefully able to step up and be able to help others and have some of these skills that we can share. And so even though I wouldn't necessarily put those two as like together like that, but it does make sense in, in this kind of a scenario. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and else I, I have think one that... thought, Peter, go ahead, McKay. Um, there's a tendency to be simplistic about these terms and think that equality means same. We will never be the same. There never has been a group of people that are same. You know, snowflakes aren't the same. Flowers aren't the same. Clovers aren't the same. Nothing's, nothing's identical. This isn't, Zion is not going to be a place of people who are the same. There's going to be extroverts and introverts, probably Republicans and Democrats, uh, ops and pessimists, people who can't, conjugate a sentence very well and and those who speak fluently you know there's going to be Sydney Rigdon's and there's going to be uh Orrin Porter Rockwell's but they can, we can be equal if we all have the same desire to bring about Zion to love one another to put other people's needs above our own and then we'll have um, a society of equals 
who are not identical in in any particular. Yeah, I love that. Equality doesn't mean sameness. Um, and maybe there's a clue in that quote, equal access to certain fundamentals. But ultimately, one of the things that the scriptures teaches is that we'll all know the Lord. No one will need to say, know you the Lord, because we'll all know the Lord. And I think that's the ultimate equality, right? We all have equal access to our Savior. We all have equal access to heavenly downloads, to the powers of heaven. And so I think that's really the beauty of Zion. And really what we're gunning for here is that type of equality, where whether you're a, you know, you know, an orator or a blacksmith or, a, you know, wherever you fit along the skills continuum is not, I mean, no one wants me building anything in Zion. They really just don't because like, this is not my natural skill set. I can grow a great tomato and I can grow zucchini and that's about it. So we'll know what we're eating in my house, but no one wants me building anything. Um, it's just not where I'm gifted, but um I think that the equality will come because as everyone does their part, uh, there will be kind of a beauty that arises out of that. So, Peter? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it's interesting. I, I didn't even know this meeting was going to happen tonight. And I've been listening to the Zion podcast and the, and the Whipsaw podcast and uh, just like the last couple of days, it's interesting what McKay says. I mean, we're we we don't we don't ever even have to be equal. I I'm a physician too. I I, I appreciate how the different parts of our body uh, work together and orchestrate things together. This is part of the economy of God in within our own bodies. In, in this body of believers that we are, we have, you know, I I'm like I, I'm I'm like what he says. I'm I'm nobody. Uh, um, special. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not eloquent with words. Uh, I do know how to wield a hammer and I, I do know how to give an injection. Um, but I, it, it's interesting that we all have something to offer. And, and really the, the thoughts I've been having is a sense of urgency, uh, especially as I listen to, uh, the, the whipsawed, um, lecture or a, a podcast where it, I just get the sense that that Denver also has uh, this sense of urgency. Nothing can be done until we have land. Then we need the infrastructure. Uh, and this has to be done rather quickly. I mean, he says it'll take a year for stuff like that to be put into place. You know, I'm sitting here wondering, well, where the heck am I going to fit into that? Um, what what do I have to offer other than um, maybe to be you know put my head in in the ring you know whatever offer whatever I can in terms of perspective and uh, and 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 just different thoughts about different things that I've been thinking about and and how we can come together and use each you know use our talents our individual gifts and talents uh, and abilities that, that we have. Um, I think it, it boils down to that, you know, organizing that in the, in the process. But I like what you said, Peter, about feeling moved by the spirit uh, to guide us in how we, sh how we should participate. Um, so I, I feel like that's something that each of us must do you know, not just in our own lives, what we what we should do to um, to share the, this, the the gospel, but also to know what we should do to be, to 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 participate to um, to be a worker in Zion. Uh, being if we're if we're all willing to to at least do that. Uh, then that is that is what's I think at, at at the basic level what's required of us. So anyway, those are my thoughts. Peter, thanks for sharing. Yeah, go ahead. 
Steve Graham, my wife, uh, Virginia and I are listening. Um, one thing that I kept thinking in my head was I, I remember a story of the early saints when they were gathering, and there is a physician who was relatively well-to-do, and there's a bunch of other people who had next to nothing, and and he, he gave everything he had to help all those other brothers and sisters emigrate, I guess, to the United States and to, and to be with the saints uh, that were gathered there. And that was the sense I've got. As, as the case said, we're not equal, we're not the same, but there are ways we can be equal. And one was he was willing to sacrifice what he had in order to help others um, gain the same blessings he wanted to have. Um, and I don't know exactly. I think that same sentiment will hopefully guide us too as we reach out and help others and fill the fill their needs and fill their gaps with what we can do for them. Absolutely. I think one of the greatest ways we can repent um, from Denver's repentance talk is to relieve suffering. And a great place to start is amongst ourselves. You know, it really both the person who's in need and the person rendering the aid are edified by that. It's not done through an organization where you don't know who got the help. It's done on an individual or a fellowship level. Um, and that is, it's beautiful. It really is. And, and yeah, there'll be sacrifices required, but I'm excited to make those sacrifices, whatever God requires. It's going to be tailored for my good and our good and his glory. And that's beautiful. It really is. Um, I'm going to read these last two quotes here that deal specifically with that expression, concerted effort. It Real says quick, the great Peter. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, uh, Karen had a, a comment yeah. or a question. I was about yeah. to say that. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I can lower my hand. <laughs> um, when you read in the book of Mormon that there was no poor among them, when you stop to think, if you're not worried about paying your utility bill, or you're not worried about health insurance, or you're not worried whether you're going to go hungry or you're going to make it to the end of the month, you develop this. I, when we do this for each other in Zion, we relieve our minds of the things of the world where we can focus more on the things that God has for us. Um, you know, when you're not in a dog eat dog world or somebody's trying to get your position at your work and um, there won't be any of that. And to, it, and just to have a neighbor or community where you see somebody has a need and just just love them to death and give, give them what they need. Um, that love is just going to just move around in the spirit. It's going to be there. And so I think when you say there's no, as you know, getting the utility set up, getting all of these things set up um, and we won't lack those things. I think that's um, helps you to develop that security as a community and um, give you more of a um, opportunity to grow in other areas. Yeah, can I get an amen from anyone? I love that, Karen, thank you. Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I mean, not to be worldly about it, but it's kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. When you're fighting to put bread on the table and like you said, keep your job, it's hard to focus on eternal things. And so, you know, but I think the a, a personal labor I'm pursuing right now is to have my heart constantly inclined to the Lord, despite the things that are going on in the world, so that Zion isn't a culture shock, so that I'm ready for it. I want to be Zion in my heart before I get to the actual place. And I think part of what we'll accomplish through what we're hoping to do here will will lead to exactly what you're describing. So, yeah, it says the great profusion of temporal and spiritual blessings, which always flow from faithfulness and concerted effort, 
never attend individual exertion or enterprise. I thought that's interesting. It has to be concerted. It's never individual exertion. And then Denver in that Whipsod podcast, which uh, Phil Red referred to, he says, uh, we have a season to prepare. Things will get better. I'm hoping for that. What we don't have is a concerted effort to try and make the necessary preparations because you can't do this stuff in haste. He said before, haste brings pestilence. So we're going to tell you kind of what this is and what this isn't. And Sandra, feel free to chime in. But basically, several of us have met in large and small gatherings to discuss how we can be proactive in doing the work of our generation. And after prayer and fasting, we've decided to follow the successful example of the scripture committee and organize teams that will begin the preparation spoken of by the Lord. So as you think about it, they're probably in this Zoom call tonight, everyone here has felt inspired or led or had a desire to learn a skill or learn a new, you know, study some things out, learn about permaculture, whatever it might've been. So I wanted to kind of explain what this is not. So what this is, is this is not an attempt to rush the past by building a physical Zion without the Lord's invitation or to be in charge of anything. All this is, is a united effort to primarily do research and recover learning. So before we can build a house, we need to establish every needful thing. And so basically, if Shawnee is learning about weaving, and my wife's learning about weaving, and my daughter wants to learn about weaving, instead of three people learning about weaving in different places in the movement, unaware of each other, we're just trying to create a framework where they can get together and have these discussions together and learn together. So there's not duplication of effort. And the hope is, my hope, is that as people work together from different fellowships, from different groups, that they'll get to know each other, they'll become precious to one another, and that their hearts will be knit together. So Sandra, are you on? Can you? Yeah. I'm here. Can you hear me? I can. I was actually going to give the, okay. you some time to discuss the framework. Okay. So I what I wanted to do was just back up a tiny bit. We talked a little bit about um, equality, but the predecessor to that was that unity would create the equality. And Denver has said that, that Zion will not spring up overnight. It is a process. And when we read in the Book of Mormon, it took time and there were three distinct phases before people created their Zion. So this part is, is how do you create unity? How do we come together? How, and, and in the framework or the, the talking about the concerted effort the goal is to take all of these soloists, um, people who could uh, perform on the world stage, and the person who's in junior high band, <laughs> and put them into in the same room together and create harmony. And so we we felt like if we're going to have unity we're going to have harmony we need to know each other we need to have a kind of an, a, a framework to hang our our shared experiences on and then also bringing in that next part about you can't do this stuff in haste and it will take effort uh, god is not going to drop zion down into our laps, we actually need to create it. So how do we do that? So you can hit the, the next slide, Peter. Hey, Sandra. Yeah. Hey, this is Marv Bateman. How are you doing? Great. How are you? I'm getting older every day. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> hey, um, uh, I also want to go back a little bit. OK. I I think sometimes we get in the framework of our mind that only us people that are in the restoration or us white guys mostly are 
going to be there. And I have a different framework. Uh, and that is that um, uh, in Denver Talk 6, he talked about where is Zion. And one of the things that he, that Joseph was looking to go when he left for the last time to go to the southwest part of the United States to find the new Jerusalem is that he was going amongst the Native Americans. Well, I have contemplated this, and as some people know, I've been around Native Americans for 31 years. And, um, you know, it's a culture shock. I've taken many, I've taken many people down to Hopi. I um, have dealt with Native Americans, Polynesians, uh, Blacks, and um, I've even met with a Dalai Lama priest. And um, we, in my view, is that one of the things that we need to do uh, spiritually is we need to uh, view our, um, our spiritual minds into humility and humbleness and so forth. I mean, we live in really nice houses. Uh, I've been I've been in homes where they've had dirt floors. There's one one home that had 13 uh, 13 kids, two parents, and two grandparents, and and there was one room. And then uh, you have uh, people all over the world that will be coming to the New Jerusalem. We're not the only ones that will be doing it, although we do have somewhat of an advantage because we have the gospel as to the books that we have, uh, to the scriptures, but in my opinion, they live it much better than we do. And so you look at, you have to, uh, in taking people down to Hopi, for instance, uh, some people just don't fit in. It just doesn't work for them. And and another, and I'm going to shift another thought, and that is we in the restoration have wheat and tares. I mean, we're not all wheat. Uh, there's wheat and tares amongst us. The next thing, one more thought, and that is that uh, you talk about unity. How do you do unity? Well, unity is kind of an interesting thing. Um, as some, some of you know, that I played professional football. And I played on some really good teams. And I played on some really crazy teams. And most of the teams um, that you have, um, uh, it's not a full unity team, for instance. But when I played with the Dallas Cowboys way back in the 70s, they had, I learned some very interesting lessons. And um, one of the things that we did in our, in our philosophy at Dallas was that we're no better than the worst player on the team. Therefore, what we did is we helped everybody. Before practice, practice would start, let's say, at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, there would be people voluntarily going out on the field at 9.30 trying to help their teammate become better. And we did this voluntarily. We didn't do this mandatorily. Uh, we did this on a voluntary basis. I've been going down to Hopi for 27 years, and I'm – you know, uh, I have a Hopi name. I've been, you know, I've been to their ceremonies. They've, they've given, you know, I've seen things that no white man has ever seen. And they trust me. And, but whenever I have a very good relationship with them. And when um, a Hopi calls me up and says, look, you know, I, I need some help, you know. Uh, one of them needed a generator. Well, 
uh, by that weekend, there was a generator at their house. Another one needed 300 bucks. I PayPal them. They're, they're my brothers. They're my sisters. And they're, I'm not, I can tell you spiritually, um, we, again, we may have the, some knowledge that they don't have, but they have some spiritual things that we don't have either. And they live in, uh, in very, very, I mean, some of them live in very humble circumstances. Some of them are still living in uh, homes that are built by rocks with cement between them that are over a thousand years old. And so I think we need to adjust our minds that we're not the only guys on the block that are going to be there. And we, I may not even be there myself. And I mean, that's, to me, that's arrogant because the Lord picks that. I don't pick that. And so the only thing I have is to understand the gospel and apply uh, the things that are given and bountiful in the scriptures, the Sermon on the Mount, and practice those things with our fellowship people, with anybody. It doesn't matter who they are, but you practice um, those kind of things and, and take the person that's the lowliness and make them better on a voluntary basis. I talked to Denver one time and I asked him, I says, uh, what would be the hardest thing uh, for the restoration people to get to Zion. And he, he didn't even bat an eye or, or skip a beat. He says, to adjust their minds and their hearts. And because we are, we, we kind of live in a fictitious world. Uh, and it's uh, a very, I mean, in comparison to Africa or some Native American villages, and some places in the world, South America and so forth, we actually live in a very, very comfortable world. And to me, to ground myself um, into reality is to go back to, to Hopi and spend a few days because it, it's a whole different world. And I think we need to adjust that and to include that into our minds because after all, Joseph, he was going out amongst the remnant Native Americans to find the New Jerusalem. And if that's where it is, wherever that is, um, it ain't going to be amongst us and it ain't going to be in our homes. It may be amongst their homes. And they don't have... You know, they don't have everything a lot we got, that's for sure. So I think a lot of this is really going back to the bountiful um, speech, you know, the, and, uh, uh, and really humbling ourselves and the skills. I think it's great to have skills uh, to, and to practice skills. I can't grow a damn thing. You know, I, I mean, I, I kill things, um, uh, and I don't have that skill. My mother, she is a green thumb, and my brother is a green thumb. But um, anyway, uh, everybody has their skills. And I think that the more skills we, we develop and then practice them and then share them and then... Um, and do this upon our own free will and choice and, and to um, uh, help one another out and to practice that within our fellowships or our neighbors or our families uh, uh, or anybody. Uh, that's a wonderful idea. But the, the idea yes. is to do something. Thank you, Thank you, Marv, for that because that's precisely what we, we had um, wanted to help facilitate 
for us to be able to work together to learn those skills. And I wholeheartedly agree with you that there will be many people, many peoples, many cultures, many places of heart and mind in Zion. And I think there's room for everyone there. Yes. And, and we have to, yeah, and we have to adjust to, to that. Yes, we want to, uh, I'm the type of person who I, I enjoy the, the discussion and the theorizing, but for me, I need to, I need to have something practical, something concrete. Well, how does this happen? What do we do? And so uh, Peter was explaining earlier that we had gotten together several different kind times with various size groups. And we had come up with what we considered a framework and a way to put some of this theory into practice to create unity and also to build our skills. So we looked at what would be needed to start a community. You, you need to have food, water, shelter, clothing, health, and some sense of community and infrastructure. And so we decided that a great way to explore those basics of life would be to create some teams. And the next, Peter, can you do the next slide? Okay, so for example, for food, food production and preservation is a huge, huge topic. And so we broke it up into a couple of different groups for farming, gardening, and animal husbandry. And we want to invite anybody who is interested at any skill level. So like I said before, the soloist who's on the world stage or the junior high orchestra, it doesn't matter. If you have an interest in learning or, or sharing, then you can participate. And if you want to have any kind of interest in food, then we invite you to be on the team that explores food. Can I interject briefly, Sandra? Because mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we emphasize this idea that you don't have to have a skill, you just have to have a desire. Correct. Kind of like a desire to believe, a desire to learn. You just have to have a desire. And I believe a God-given desire. You have to feel inspired to move in this direction. Because Denver has said, you're not going to get called to the work by a man or a committee. You're going to get called by the Lord. So if you feel like one of these teams is something that you feel called to, then by all means, please participate. Because I think that whether or not I learned to grow anything other than tomatoes and zucchini isn't as relevant as am I able to have my heart knits to knit with those that are on my team? Am I able to, you know, learn and learn to learn and be humble like Marv was talking about? Sorry, Sandra, didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, fine. And if, if you are uh, an expert tomato grower, Peter, and I can't grow a tomato, but I've met you on this team and we've talked together. And when I'm trying to grow my tomato, I can call you up or I can visit you at your house or whatever it is. We've gotten that, that sense of unity and we've gotten a place that we can go to share information and to, to be edified by sharing and by learning together. So if you, um, one of the teams is a farming team because there are certain kinds of, when you have a community, there are certain kinds of crops that have a, an economy of scale. You can't, an individual person on their own home garden plot can't grow the wheat and the sugarcane beets or the sunflower seeds for their oil or whatever it is and a large enough scale to, to do that individually. That's why there are commodity crops. So 
anybody interested in the in a farming type thing where the infrastructure would be for fields and uh, the the basic staples for both people and animal then you'd be invited to, to participate in the farming team so the next team would be gardening and special projects so the home garden the orchards and the fruit trees the nut trees maple trees beekeeping um growing gardens in high altitude learning how to cook in a high altitude this would be the the expanded uh, food resources so that you have your fruits and your vegetables and your other things that, that are fun to eat. And included in that, if you're interested in a bakery or the greenhouse or beehives or an oil press or the wine press, or you know how to, how to do root cellars or want to learn how to do a root cellar, you would be want to, invited to participate in the gardening and the special projects team. Hey, and Sandra. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry. Two seconds. Yeah. Um, maybe I missed it. Um, is there like a, a team sign up? Is there a place where people can uh, we do haven't, that? We haven't covered that yet. Where okay. We right. I'll... Teams were. That's fine. Okay. Back to the background I go. Thank you. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to get this all posted online as well, correct? Yeah. Cool. Right. Peter? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So everyone, if you don't already know where the website is, we will tell you that at the end and everybody can get download this stuff we'll get it up there really quick okay go ahead okay so another team is animal husbandry so people are interested in the breeding uh people interested in um veterinarian care um people who have chickens I mean, just anything to do with animals their feeding their care their breeding their housing. Um, this team would figure out fences. We lived on a farm and I, we learned very, very quickly, fencing is the key to happy animals and happy animal caretakers. So this team would explore different kinds of fencing and a milk bar in the cheese cave, a dairy, uh, the processing house, where are you processing your meat? So uh, that would be a team. The next team would be Peter. Uh, the network. <laughs> I, I don't know if we skipped one or not. Um, shelter. Water. Water's next. Okay. So water. People are interested in all things water, aquaculture, hydroponics, aquaponics, uh, the hatchery, a fishery, a, the grain mill, the sawmill, the, anything about uh, wells, um, managing a lake or a river, water tanks, whatever it is, anything to do with water, interest, uh, invited to participate on the water team. Uh, shelter and alternative energy. So house construction, yeah, if, if we're in the tops of the mountains, what kind of housing are we going to be talking about? Are we talking about, uh, well, we could get 100 people in the room and 100 people would have different ideas about an ideal housing. But this uh, team would get together and discuss some of those and talk about, well, how, how primitive do we need to plan for? Are we, do we need to have a, an ice box or a cellar? Will we have refrigeration? What do you do with your solid waste? Um, how do you stay warm and safe and dry in, in creating this uh, Zion-like community? The next team would be clothing and textiles all kinds of spinning, dyeing, weaving, sewing, everything to do with clothing, uh, diapers, feminine supplies, beds and beddings, people who work with um, any kind of textile, any kind of fiber, uh, that would be another team. Uh, the next team is health and wellness. So we would have 
anyone interested at all in allopathic medicine or traditional complementary and alternative medicine, people who have, are learning about herbs, uh, homeopathics, uh, hygiene, we need sanitation and disinfectants, cleaning methods. Um, so this team would explore things like a clinic, a cemetery, and a distillery. So anyone who's interested in health and health maintenance would be invited to participate in that team. The next one would be skilled crafts, uh, woodworking, glass blowing, pottery, tool making, knife making, blacksmithing, paper making, anybody who is interested in learning and uh, sharing skills. Can I interrupt again, Sandra, just yeah, very briefly? Please. Friends, if you have a desire in any of these areas, like we will post, we'll kind of explain how to become involved, that kind of thing. The idea is not that Sandra and I or anyone that kind of originally came up with this lead the show. It's kind of self-directed. We're just trying to provide a framework for discussion. And what will amaze you is as you're prayerful about what you feel like the Lord wants you to do, you'll be led to resources to learn skills and those kinds of things. Literally just this week, my, one of my kids sent me a TikTok video, <laughs> which that that's a whole different conversation um, about how to have a sawmill in your own backyard. And I was like, holy cow, where'd that come from? But they sent it to me and I was like, this is perfect. And, you know, this that's not my skill set. But when I watched how the guy built this, the sawmill in his backyard, I was like, that's incredible. You could use this in Zion. You could use this to create lumber, you know? And I think that as we open our eyes, the Lord will lead us through really interesting means sometimes to the resources that are out there and we can learn skills and share those with others and grow together as, as we accomplish this. So sorry. Absolutely. And, uh, the reason that we're even talking about teams rather than just individuals it goes back to that quote at the very, very beginning, that it needs to be a concerted effort, that an individual is not going to be able to do this on their own. Uh, at the very, very beginning, uh, when we were first, uh, the, the groups, the Southern Utah County Fellowships that were getting together and talking about this concerted effort. I shared this with them. Um, when we lived on our farm, we had lived there for a couple of years and had been kind of established with our garden and our animals and different things. And I decided that I was ready to try a day of living off our land. And I got up in the morning, early in the morning, literally spent 12, 14, maybe 16 hours of the day. And the goal was to um, use the milk from the, the, you know, I milked the cow, I gathered the egg, I baked the bread, I fi fixed guard dinner from the garden. And it was, beautiful we had a lovely everything was was delicious but i cried at the end of the day not just because i was exhausted but i realized i had spent literally every moment of the entire day just trying to feed my family dinner and i had not grown the wheat I had not grown the alfalfa that fed the hay to my cows. Um, I had not mined the salt that was in my food. I hadn't made my plates and my dishes. The things that I had not done far, far, far outshadowed all of the things that I had done. And it was very humbling and, and a, serious eye-opener to me that we need community of different skills, people who love to do different things, and we have to work together. Living alone on the land is may sound 
um, romantic, but it's not. <laughs> You're, you'd be very hungry if that's what, all you had to do. So the, uh, the last team that we were talking about was community culture and education. And that's to put the fire in our hearts as well as in the bellies. Um, literature, music, art, humanities, uh, creating a library, um, musical performance and instruction, dances, musicals, sports, having parks and recreation, all those different kinds of things. So there should be in all of this, we, we, we try to distill it down to the very basics. It's very, very easy to look. As, as Marv was saying earlier, we live kind of in a fictitious world. We have every option available to us at our fingertips every day. But we need to distill that down to the basics. We need to come to an agreement, where do we start? And rather than expand out to all the possibilities, come together and, and find maybe some solutions in simplicity. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Uh, th there's a few things that I'd like to add uh, that I think are quite significant. Okay. So something that I haven't heard anybody talk about when it comes to Zion, and this is something that's easily proved by the scriptures, is that there will be no earthly government in Zion. Because government's a telestial concept. It involves one institution using force and unrighteous dominion to make everyone else follow its commands. And so everything that governments normally do, we all, we all have to find a way to organize with each other without any violence. And part of that is gonna mean we're gonna have to have our own currency because <laughs> you know, it, it will not work out well for us if we're using you know, the currency of the Gentiles when we're trying to form our own society because then we're susceptible to all the manipulations and distortions of that very currency. And so I think, uh, you know, part, part of economics is, you know, whenever there's demand for any good or service, the market will form. And so I'm not too worried about the specifics about how we provide all of these things, because these are things that people are very good at, at specializing and solving those. I, what I try to stress is that we cannot uh, rely on this idea of government, that force is good if a certain group has it, right? Because right. the, the definition of government is it's an institution that has a monopoly on the use of force over a geographic region. Right. And so, so this effort is in no way any kind of effort to create a government or a governing body. Or yeah. a currency. Or a currency. Those are issues that are way above our pay grade. <laughs> Yeah. And not this even is... the subject of what, what this effort is about. This effort is to get like-minded people. So my interest is in health. And uh, it's not that it's not important though, right? It's no, important. No, it, yeah. it is important and it will be addressed eventually. Yes. Just this, not by us. This is a preliminary research-based organization, if you want to call it an organization, it's, it's a research-based group of individuals coming together to share information and to learn together because mm -hmm. in my experience, when people come together that share a passion about the same thing and you discuss it among yourselves, um, it helps you to not only understand your point or your position or your understanding better, but it, it helps them too. And as you discuss it, you, you learn to love each other, get to know each other. I mean, if, if, if Phil and I are going to both be working in health, I'd like to know Phil just a little bit. I'd like to know what he thinks about medicine and, and how to help people heal. And I'd like to know other people's ideas about that. Um, I, I'm not particularly interested in 
uh, learning every kind of herb and what it looks like and how to grow it and how to compound it. But well, of course. I have other, other interests. So if we get a group of five people in the room and start talking about it, then we can come to some kind of idea about well, what, what actually would we need to do to, to create a cemetery? I mean, have, has that, you know, I can't yeah. find that individually. I guess I could dig a hole in my backyard, but as a community, <laughs> we may want to have a more formalized understanding of what happens. But, but my, main, my main point yeah. here is just that the economic and social structure of Zion is very alien to our current culture. Absolutely. And to get there, we have to make that leap. And so right. that, that's why I'm saying talking about things like currency, I focus on incentives because again, the economic structure has to be different. It cannot be the Gentile way. Right. And, and I think so, we're even um, at the point to, to address that. I think what the, the, this whole effort and I'm not mm -hmm. saying it won't come in time. I just think, think it's premature to get there because- Sandra? I'm, yes. Uh, I, I'm trying, I, I think one thing that might help on your list, let's add that. Let's add uh, a discussion about folks that are interested in talking about currencies or structures or whatever. Computer, that also was computers. Actually, a, so a, a programming that. team. Okay. Could I please- Yeah, have go ahead. For a minute, okay. The, the, the groups that we had been working with uh, over a course of months, we actually discussed things like currency. We, we discussed uh, having a red brick store. We discussed a, a, a whole bunch of different things and then decided that that was beyond the scope of this initial effort. Okay. Because it could create, uh, we, you've got to lay the foundation. And we just wanted to bring people together who shared common interests. And then that together will naturally evolve into something uh, more mature. But if I don't know you and you don't know me, how do you and I discuss um, money? I, it's, it's a difficult thing for married people to talk about money, right? I, I actually don't believe we're going to have a currency. I, Nor do I. I don't either, I, but, but I don't want to talk about it. I just, that's so far beyond the scope of what we're trying to do with this effort that I don't, I don't want to get sidetracked in, into doing that. Let me so, just say that it was ahead, discussed initially among our group that was initially coming up with the framework and we, we paired it back. We want food, clothing, shelter, uh, skills, the water, just the basics. And, and, the, and then the community, the library and the sports, things like that. So let's, let's get together in teams of people who share a common interest, get to know each other, work together, um, amplify and multiply our skills by, by discussing them and sharing them with each other. So I'm gonna turn the time back to Peter to explain how, if you are interested in participating on a team and you can be on more than one team if you want to be, there, there is no limit on teams. The only um, request is that uh, don't try to spread yourself too thin. If you sign up for every single team, then it may be difficult to really delve into participating meaningfully in the team that you're passionate or about or that, or that the Lord wants you to participate in maybe a little more robustly. So Peter, here you go. Thanks, Sandra. So I, I just want to comment on a couple of things. I think Denver's podcast on harmony and the need for harmony amongst brethren 
as these teams coalesce and form naturally around these different topics, one of the goals is that hearts are knit together. Because I think when hearts are knit together, then God can govern. Then God can lead by inspiration. And that you don't need one man or woman imposing his will on another. And I really think that, that there's an equality to be had there. Um, the topics, the kind of the groups that formed, kind of the teams that were, uh, you know, originally kind of brainstormed came from talks that Denver gave. They were just, they kind of coalesced around topics that he had brought up in various talks. And so we didn't, we felt like it'd be kind of like Sandra used the term above our pay grade to kind of go beyond that. I don't think there's anything wrong with someone getting together and forming a group to discuss other topics. I think that's totally cool. But for the purposes of this, um, we just wanted to focus on, and once again, to go back to that initial discussion of process more than product, I think how this all plays out, what matters more is the love we have for each other and our ability to communicate and work together in harmony. And it looks like the Barlows have their hand raised and they're welcome to share. I don't know how to unmute you. I Am I, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so I just had a question on how, how to get involved. Sure. Um, I'm how to going, connect with people. I'm going to post. Are you going to go link. into that right now? Yeah, right now. I'm going to post a link okay. to, to, I'll provide my email. I don't want to be the contact point because I'm trying to avoid someone being in charge. It's like this huge thing, right? No one wants to be in charge. And so I'm trying to avoid being in charge. So what we're doing is we've got a Google doc with the, with the teams on, and there's a contact person for each team. That contact person is not a leader. They're just a contact person. Someone who said, sure, I'll be the contact person. So I'm the contact person for communication. Basically, my job is just to make sure that everyone gets the information on, of the team, on the teams. That's the only reason I'm even on this thing tonight is because I got volunteered by other people uh, <laughs> to, to be the communications guy. And so I um, created a spreadsheet. It's super simple. It's a Google spreadsheet. I'll share it with all of you. In the chat feature, if you want to share your email address, or I shared an email, you can email that email, and we'll share the Google Doc, and you can put your name and your phone number and your email and what you're interested in, and we'll add you to that spreadsheet, and you'll see whoever else is in your team, and um, uh, and then you can get together. You guys can, however you want to run it. You want to run it every month, someone else is running the show or it's all done by common consent. However you want to do it is entirely up to you guys. The idea is just that you coalesce around topics so there isn't duplication of effort and you get to know each other and love each other and learn together. I think that's really it. So I, if you will, I'll put my email in the chat and I'll put Sandra's email in the chat and you're welcome to email us and we'll just share that Google doc with you and you can put your info in there. Does that sound fair guys? Okay, and we will put that on the website. So if you go to religionofthefathers.info, then the, there should be, we, can we link the spreadsheet? Yeah. The spreadsheet and all the information for the food, the farming garden, all the different categories that you've got, plus people can watch this. And then your two emails for connecting us up. How wonderful, Peter, this is so much work and Sandra, Hats off to you. What a great well, start this time. It, it was like it was a group effort. I don't think any one of us can take credit for it. And really, once again, to go back to the comment I made at the very beginning, all the great things in the restoration have come from prayer. They've come from a boy going into a grove, from someone earnestly seeking to understand something they encountered in scripture. And I think it all is behooved upon us to go to the Lord in prayer and say, what part, portion of this belongs to me? What do I need to do, Lord? Because I think we all have our own tendencies and our own desires. But I think one of the mistakes I've made historically is to 
speak too much and not listen enough and to maybe obviously not yield my will to his. And so I think yielding to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, yielding to uh, the will of the Father and seeking the mind of the Father and the Son in this endeavor, that is what will lead to concerted effort because no one amongst us is the conductor of this orchestra. Jesus Christ is the conductor. And if we submit to him, that's when we'll see miracles. That's when we'll see Zion. So that's all I have to say. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment um, related to sort of timelines on this. And I know this is kind of new, but anybody who was here on the um, presentation last week, um, we were talking about one of the things that we could do in relation to the, the, the camp experience for the last week in March was doing some sort of a Zion's Fair. And, um, and that seemed to be something that people were excited about. What I'd like to consider bringing up to this group is since we've learned about this concerted effort process, what I thought maybe something for us to ponder upon is coming to that um, retreat and maybe coalescing our ideas that we were learning about in these teams to be able to share with everybody um, in a, a format where people can kind of do a round robin. You know, I come from Boy Scouts. I'm thinking of the Scatterama, but but uh, where you learn and you can you can kind of rotate around and learn from each other and 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 it's just something to think about because we're trying to find some some programs and some some uh content while we're camping down there to to uh um enrich our lives and have us learn and so you know again um that might be a good sort of a, a finish line you know it doesn't have to be forever finish line you can go on past that but but to come together and say, hey, we met in these teams and here's what we've learned. Great idea. Maybe we can uh, have something on the website where people can sign up to have like a little booth at the little, not a scout arama, but maybe the <laughs> Passover arama. <laughs> something fun. Okay, good idea, Peter. Um, You're welcome. We will, again, like I said, we will post all this stuff um, this week on the website. If you want to go to religionofthefathers.info, it will be linked there. And thank you for everybody that has participated. We appreciate you. And come back next week, same time, 7 p.m.